Welcome everyone uh, to the second global uh, peace tech talk and thank you for uh, joining us uh, this evening. I'm Professor Leah Borged. I'm a part by professor at the European University Institute, the Robert Schumann Center. And the topic of our session today, titled AI for Peace, Ukrainian refugees matching in Europe, is both important and timely. It relates to the idea, well, indeed, the already existing platform, to use matching theories and new technologies, big data, AI, match machine learning, to facilitate the admission and uh, settlement of Ukrainian refugees to European member state. And we are delighted to have some of the world's uh, most distinguished researchers in the field uh, from different disciplines. We have a legal scholar, a computer scientist, and an economist, uh, as well as uh, a future leader and thinker from the SDG to share with us their insight on uh, how matching theories and also digital technologies can contribute to the promotion of peace worldwide and kind of build new bridges between Euro European citizens and institutions and refugees uh, in this particular case from Ukraine. This is part of um, kind of the second peace, uh, global tech for peace talk uh, organized by the School of Transnational Governance at the European University Institute. Uh, this is a project which runs by my great colleague, uh, Miguele Giovannardi. Uh, just maybe a one word on uh, global uh, peace tech. Uh, the idea, it's a new project at the STG, at the European University Institute, that brings um, together technology experts, academic policymakers, to think uh, together on how new technologies can be, uh, can be implemented to promote peace. Uh, the session today will focus on matching algorithm in refugees allocation on private, national, but also the European level. And our first speaker was supposed to be uh, Mr. Umberto Rosini, uh, the chief uh, of the IT department at the Italian uh, government, the, the civil protection presidency of the Council of Ministers in Italy. But unfortunately, just 10 minutes before our session, uh, he was called uh, by the ministry uh, to something urgent, so he won't be able to join us today. So we will start with uh, our first speaker, uh, who is uh, Zach El Shamali. Uh, Zach is a master's student at the School of uh, Transnational Governments and also a fellow at Oxford University. Uh, he will soon start his PhD program, I hope it's correct, at the, Europe, at the United Nations University in Maastricht. Uh, Zach, actually, we must say that Zach is the initiator, initiator of this uh, peace uh, tech talk. He, uh, coming from Syria himself uh, to Europe in 2015, he also has personal experience with the topic. And uh, over since, he has been actively involved in assisting in matching Ukrainian refugees with the uh, host uh, across Europe. I had the privilege uh, to teach Zach this semester at the EUI. And I can say, well, you will see it soon, that he is a leader and a future thinker. So, Zach, we're going to give you five more minutes extra, uh, and the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Liav, and thank you for the Global Peace Tech Hub for organizing this, because the opportunity to discuss this timely topic with such global thinkers in various fields is definitely an opportunity that a master's student can only dream of. But in these difficult times, I think we need to work together to find the next way forward. So before I start, I just want to start with a preface. We're discussing the allocation of refugees. We're using academic and technical language, but this should not, under any circumstance, take away the humanity and the individuality of each of these refugees. If anything, we're trying to support and give more options and uh, support for refugees. So my short presentation is the result of an, uh, our semester of work with Professor Orgad, but also of the work that I've been doing for uh, Ukrainian refugees with support from the EUI, of course, and the steps forward for what can we do actually uh, as academics and as uh, future practitioners. So my talk will be a very short introduction, three points and a conclusion. My three points will be about decision making as a science, about the existing schemes of existing uh, matching and the effect of allocation versus matching on refugees, which is the area of research that I was working on. So 
First, I'll start with the simple problem that I have uh, faced when we started working. We had a lot of Ukrainian refugees caused by the war. Many of them wanted to stay in Poland, so it's close to Ukraine. But this was causing a bit of uh, stress on the infrastructure of Poland, whether education or so on. The way at the same time when I was doing matching, there was way more offers in Italy and in Germany from the lists and the organizations that I was work with. So in simple economic terms, and I'm not an economist, that wasn't me, there was a gap between supply and demand. There was much more supply. We had around 10 houses in Italy to every refugee that was being allocated. So with this data, we started asking questions. Okay, of course, now we have to, how best to match the capacity and the preferences of refugees, how to balance between the state and the interest of refugees, but also it raised questions about asylum politics. For example, Professor Teutelboim was writing in 2016 and 17 at the time of the Syrian refugee crisis. Now we have a different refugee crisis and the dynamics of which are different. So there was a lot of talk about the Dublin Agreement, reforms of the Dublin Agreement, and of course, the geopolitical problem, which is the weaponization of refugees previously uh, by Belarus, also with the Polish border. So this is the context under which we're approaching this. Now, the point number one that I'm going to make starts from a recent book that I read by Professor Kahneman. It's called Noise, The Flaw in Human Judgments. And this book discusses the process of decision-making that we do. And he finds that there is a huge amount of noise that we have in legal systems and in decisions that for the sake of justice and for the sake of fairness, should produce the same results. So for example, if two exact asylum seekers applied for asylum, would both of them get the same results if they were faced in different areas or by different judges? So, or would they integrate the same way and flourish if they were uh, in this area or another? So this book raised the issue of the fact that there are no standards, the, the preferences are unclear. And this is when we started doing mistakes later. Of course, there are, uh, what are the variables that are likely to take uh, play part in this decision? How do we uh, decide about them? These were the kind of areas that opened the line. The second point and the main point of uh, what I'm talking is the existing mechanisms about matching for refugees that we're researching. So the existing mechanism, the categories, it's up to you. You can do private, public, you can do uh, citizen, state, transnational, that is up to you. We, I'm working on a policy brief uh, for our class that I'm mapping them, but I can give an overview uh, now or in the ways that I think can be categorized. There is always the citizen to citizen uh, transfer. So for example, there were two Harvard students, uh, Avi and uh, Marco, who made a matching platform. It's called Ukraine Take Shelter, where it's a student when it's a citizen to citizen hosting, for example. Now, the issues with this kind is usually insufficient structure. There was an issue with authentication, identification, and so on. And this is usually when the state comes in to protect both the refugees from exploitation and, of course, the hosts. So, of the second type was business to citizen. So, for example, Airbnb, LinkedIn, they all had some form of matching algorithms and matching initiatives for uh, Ukrainian refugees. And of course, there was the issue here was the selection bias, the incomplete scope of services and uh, so on. And finally, of course, there was universities, there were uh, academic networks, there were uh, NGOs, so in more diverse areas. And finally, the highest, highest, highest level was UNHCR. So these are the transnationals. So this was more or less trying to figure out what is out there and what is their strength and what is their limitation and what can be mixed together and what cannot be. So this is where, uh, where most of the work is happening. Now, I'll, I'll take a small point out from the second point and tell you that I'm also trying to uh, 
push this approach of burden sharing and giving more options on the European scale, because as uh, was written before by Professor Teutelboim, the problem is that refugees have no choice and states have no control. So the question is about empowering both and trying to provide interest instead of working in this semi-blind market of uh, asylum seekers and states uh, being unclear. Now, my third and final point is about the effect of allocation versus matching on refugees. And this is where the research that I was working on in Germany comes in, because in Germany, there is something called the Königstein Schlüssel. So the Königstein key quota for, for distribution of federal states. It's a federal system. It's uh, decided two thirds, I think, tax collection, one third number of people. Of course, very for it's used for all kinds of policies, not just for asylum, but it is also used in asylum seeker distribution across Germany. And as someone who arrived in Germany was in one place and then reallocated to another place, I had questions about this, about allocation as telling refugees go here versus selection or matching when we send refugees to a place. And the results of my master thesis, I found that over 65% of the refugees that were allocated in Germany reallocated afterwards. So there was clearly a matching issue in the uh, Königstein quota and the uh, easy system that is currently used by the BAMF in Germany. And also my main question was about the variations of political socialization for these refugees in the different states. So if somebody, for example, was matched in Brandenburg or Berlin next to Catherine and Liev, would it be the same, their socialization, as if they were matched with Ariel? So these, of course, the answer is no. But these were the kind of questions that we were trying to explore, but on more local scales, because I really, really believe that the effect of context is very important uh, on refugee allocation and uh, also distribution. So now to sum up very quickly, we are in a particular situation. Variables are changing very quickly. There is a window of opportunity now. The EU is discussing the Europeanization of migration policy and I think that for all of the work that is being done around the area, so both in economic terms, so efficiency and clearing and so on, but also in programming and also in fundamental rights terms, I think this is a topic that needs to be a bit more public because the, at the end, the result is going to be political, whether uh, we would like to believe it or not. And the question is, how can we contribute to the debate to highlight the various effect of the variables. So this will be it from my part. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Zach, for this uh, general overview of the topic and your own personal experience. Uh, I will definitely want to pick up some of the points that you have raised, including the politics of uh, refugee matching uh, and your own experience on that and insight. I think we have discussed some of this topic already uh, during the Q&A session. Um, I will move uh, now to um, our next speaker, uh, and this will be Professor Katrin Costello. Uh, she is the co-director of the Center for Fundamental Rights at the Hertie School uh, in Berlin. Professor Costello is, uh, I think I'm not exaggerating, I'm saying that uh, she's one of the world experts on refugees and migration law. I have uh, myself relied extensively on her uh, writing. She's also an older of uh, the prestige uh, ERC grant on refugee policy and uh, Mellon Professor of Refugees and Migration Law at University of Oxford. Uh, she's currently the director of a special project uh, funded by the Volkswagen Foundation, which is called Algorithmic Fairness for Asylum Seekers and Refugees, which kind of explores directly uh, addresses the topic that we want to uh, investigate because it explore, explores the use of new technologies for uh, refugees, governments in Europe. And she advised, among other things, uh, in a, among an academic work, or in addition to her academic work, she also advised the uh, UNHCR, European Parliament, and the Council of Europe. So, Professor Costello, please. Uh, thank you, Leah, for that uh, really uh, excessive <laughs> introduction.
So the, the AFAR project that you mentioned on algorithmic fairness was launched on the 1st of April. So it's really uh, this year. So it's really uh, a new area of scholarly interest for me. And it looks at both the threat of new technologies as an instrument of migration control, uh, you know, and I think a very pervasive one, and also its potential. And I think in preference matching, we see some of the potential. Uh, so I maybe wanted to step back a little as the legal scholar without technical expertise here and just talk about the uh, response to the arrival of Ukrainian protection seekers and the distinctiveness of it. Um, because I would want to push back a, a little against any sort of um, sort of sense that this is a replication of um, the European responses in 2015 and 2016. Because, and I would do that under four headings. Um, and then talk about whether preference matching and what it offers is as necessary now as it might have seemed uh, back then. So I think the first point to say is that the most significant distinction is that Ukrainians, um, at least Ukrainian nationals, currently since 2017 enjoy visa-free access to the territory of EU member states. Uh, and also, for the most part, when they flee, they flee directly into EU territory. So the EU has two moves that are not available to it, or at least that it hasn't considered. It has not considered reimposing a visa requirement, nor has it, um, it, it cannot make legal arguments about safe third country. So when Syrians were fleeing, uh, in almost invariably, there were no visas for them. Visas, by definition, are short-term visas. So if you look like you're going to claim asylum, you will have your visa application turned down. That is baked into contemporary visa systems, unless it's a special humanitarian visa, and there are hardly any of those. Uh, and states don't you know, uh, issue them en masse. So, so that was the predicament, that was the containment practices that have become a hallmark of the global refugee regime, arguably since the 1980s, certainly since the end of the Cold War, um, really playing out to just grotesque effect when you had large numbers of protection seekers being forced to travel by irregular means. Irregular means don't have to be dangerous, but in a world of carrier sanctions, they are dangerous because regular planes and ferries cannot be boarded. And they add an additional layer, uh, even more impervious layer for the would-be uh, traveler. And Ukrainians are not in that situation. They flee directly into an EU member state. I'm not downplaying the difficulties and dangers of fleeing. For many people, they are risking their lives to flee because obviously the, the ag Russian aggression is life-threatening for many people. And also there have been very disturbing documented uh, incidents of racialized violence towards people trying to leave Ukraine, in particular of non-Ukrainian nationals. But the question about access to a space of protection is completely different. And then I think the real shock for any observers of EU asylum policy was the decision to trigger EU-wide temporary protection status, which in my legal opinion is a status. And what that has uh, added into it, and again, I think here also something that I think was a surprise, is mobility across the EU in effect. So the EU hasn't officially suspended Dublin, but it is not applying it because the category of temporary protection beneficiary is somebody who can choose their place of refuge. Now that is the de facto reality for asylum seekers in Europe. Dublin has never been enforced en masse. It is a system which, who's in the, the words of a very promising young scholar, Francesco Bosso describes as a system whose long, whose non-compliance is the elixir of the Dublin system's long life. Okay, It is a system of allocation that was never fully enforced, but it did meant asylum seekers traditionally always risked being detained and deported and sent back somewhere else if they were moving onwards, say, from Poland to Germany. That's out of the system as well. So what we're looking at is this really huge real-time uh, I mean, I guess from a social science point of view, might, you might want to call it an experiment in a different way of dealing with protection seekers, which is to offer a grant of temporary protection, so for two to three years, which enables a certain degree of mobility. So we're not in the world of, and Alex Teitelbaum, you were quoted earlier, um, uh, a system where refugees have no choice and states have no choice. So here we have a situation of having empowered refugees relatively, and I'm not trivializing 
the traumas and the difficulties. You know, I'm in Berlin. There are thousands of people who have arrived and continue to arrive in the Hauptbahnhof and are trying to find themselves places to stay and to work. But, you know, this is a system where they can then choose. They can pause. They can bring friends and family elsewhere in Europe. They can look for jobs and they are able to do this themselves. Right. The legal impediments are not what are going to constrain them. So I think against that background, I think it's really important to look at what would refugees gain from preference matching, because these are not refugees with no choices. These are temporary protection beneficiaries who have an EU-wide space that they can navigate themselves. So I just want, I mean, it might seem like a very simple point, but I really wanted to emphasize that. Uh, the third point, uh, this, sorry, I'm, I'm looking at my own list. <laughs> I suppose, secondly, I wanted to pick up some of these points about noise and variation in recognition rates, because there too, I think, you know, we now at this stage have a vast body of very solid qualitative and quantitative social science on problematic variation in outcomes of asylum systems, particularly in Europe, but it's really a global phenomenon. Uh, Sean Rehack scholarship in Canada, Rebecca Hamlin comparing the US, Canada, and Australia. Numerous studies, Eric Neumeyer and very many other um, quantitative social scientists who've problematized variation, which tells us that, you know, when you apply for asylum in Europe, whether you get recognized or not, is not simply a factor of the strength of your claim or the extent to which your experience fits within a definition of refugeehood or even an expanded notion. Uh, so much so that the legal scholar Greg Arnall, in his contribution to the Oxford Handbook of International Refugee Law, said, really, we have to look at this system and question whether it's not entirely arbitrary. But again, Ukrainians don't have to do that yet. So temporary protection just gives them this two to three years before refugeehood has to be determined. Now, that's really valuable waiting time. They're not waiting in a camp for potential resettlement that may never come. In a way, Europe is their waiting room, right? So we're not saying refugeehood will never have to be determined. For now, the decision is forestalled. But that two to three years might be extremely important to think through these institutional questions. Because, you know, I, in my mind and what I study a lot in my ERC project are mechanisms of group recognition, which says, yes, you're all in the same boat. This doesn't have to be a question of individualized assessment based on your credibility and the other arbitrary factors that we know corrupt, essentially, bureaucratic processes, uh, we can simply decide, you know, everyone is a refugee because they're all in a shared predicament. But for now, that's just forestalled by this temporary protection mechanism. So when we look against that backdrop, questions about allocation, I think it's quite important to think, well, what would really help refugees? Because at the moment, um, obviously, there is um, a situation in Poland, arguably Czech Republic, a number of other um, close by states where, you know, they're quite understandably, there are concerns about accommodation and capacity to, you know, offer people employment and get children into school. And so, you know, and people are moving, you know, I think there is a process where if you look at the numbers, there are people making decisions and looking for places elsewhere to go. And I think there you could see the role for uh, Zach, the kind of me matching mechanisms that you identified you know, as platforms to help people find accommodation and jobs and schooling. Uh, and maybe those are the three key factors that need to be integrated. But that would really be preference matching, you know, preferences where, um, it, you know, obviously we know from the science of matching and, and others here are more equipped to speak to that, that that can be more of a better way of getting at better outcomes, you know, because you can offer people a range of options and they can see what sort of what is actually available to them. So you can both enhance their choice and make sure that they find somewhere that's a better fit for them, even according to some very kind of rudimentary idea of what people need. Um, so I can see the role for, for that sort of allocation mechanism, but it doesn't have to have an element of coercion to it. Right? So even within Germany, the Koenigsteiner Schlüssel has an element of coercion to it, has an element of uh, forced registration at certain addresses and a certain degree of um, penalties if people don't stick to their allocated place of reference. So I really did, would want to just emphasize the question about preference and how preferences are built into the system and also the questions about whether we need to build any coercion into a system which at the moment is working through self-allocation. Um, and there's, I, as far as I understand from very, you know, brief discussions with people working, you know, in 
the very westerly um, parts of Europe where I'm from. So in Ireland, for example, or speaking to NGOs in Poland, you know, the Ukrainians are arriving uh, and arrivals are being managed. You know, school places are being found, accommodation is being found. Of course, this is challenging, but there is a system of self-allocation working. And for now, there aren't pleas for any core system of matching, which would, you know, force people into the system. And I think that's a crucial difference between preference matching when it's part of a course of system and platforms to enable people to have a wider range of well-informed choices to inform their decisions about where they're going to seek protection. Um, and maybe that's as much as I wanted to say because I know um, Alex is going to come in here, but I was struck, Alex, in our discussions about Annie Moore, which is obviously just this, you know, a great example here that it's not really about preferences. It's about um, optimizing employment um, prospects. And I think they're, I think, you know, I, I think we really have to be, you know, aware of what is going into matching algorithms in terms of what their what outcome they're trying to maximize. Um, and the project that I'm aware of and following very closely in Germany called the Match In Project is really trying to open up much more this space about um, what is what information people need to think through in order to inform an outcome about where they are best suited. So, you know, much wider range of variables to be considered in relation to access to hospitals, schooling, what kind of, you know, social life that somebody would want, you know, um, and sort of really broadening out the discussion beyond just looking at um, employment prospects, which are, of course, vital. But I mean, I think it's very reductionist to think that that's um, the best factor. And I suppose one thing that I think for social scientists to really think through is what is the role of autonomy in successful outcomes? You know, if you, if you choose to go to Ireland and you go there and it's a struggle, but you make it, I mean, are you more likely to have a successful integration outcome if you've chosen the place you go uh, rather than having been sent somewhere or even being told where to go by a machine? Um, I think that's a really, really important question about humanity and how we engage with technology. And I, I really just want to put that out there right away, that there's a reason that we value autonomy and it's not just an instrumental reason. Okay, thanks everyone. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Catherine. Just to um, uh, kind of do a promotion for your project for the Algorithmic Fairness for Asylum Seekers, I've seen that it's already online and there is a call for PhDs. So for those of the students who are interested, uh, it's already online. Uh, feel free to apply. Um, three points that, again, I would bring in during the Q&A is that, uh, and maybe they are also relevant to our next speaker, is number one, you mentioned preferences. Uh, I We also discussed the possibility uh, of the idea of kind of measuring and testing changing preferences uh, by whatever machine learning or some big data and other uh, possibilities to not just to test the preferences here and now, but also kind of ch changing preferences over time uh, according to different criteria. Number two, in addition to employment that you mentioned other options, um, there is always the possibility to design a system which is kind of uh, in according to the Canadian style of sponsoring a refugee in which individual can then uh, submit their preferences. If I want to host a refugee in Berlin, uh, according to some uh, preferences, would it be, uh, I'm sure technologically it's, it's, it's possible, but also the kind of uh, political and legal aspect of, uh, of something like that. And then the third, you mentioned what, um, what refugees can take out of the matching system. And I want to bring another aspect that what state can take out of it and how what state can take it out of it can help what the refugees in kind of increasing the numbers of refugees that uh, state are willing to uh, to take. Uh, so we will have uh, all of these uh, topics and 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 others uh, soon. Now, our next speaker uh, is Professor Alexander Teitelbaum, uh, who is writing actually on refugees matching. Has brought me to be interested in the topic a few years ago. Uh, he is uh, among the experts on the topic. He is associate professor uh, at the Department of Economics also Oxford University and a senior, a senior research fellow at the Institute for New, uh, New Economic Thinking uh, at Oxford. Uh, perhaps most important to our topic is uh, the co-founder of Refugees AI, uh, dot, uh, AI uh, which is an organization that is developing new technologies for refugee resettlement. So this is not just an academic project, he's taking it into 
a real policy. And I think he's the among uh, very few academic who through his writing also established a new field of research and policy. So Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for having me. Apologies for joining late, uh, of course, in this um, um, world of online uh, uh, seminars like this. I got the time zones completely messed up. Um, I should say thank you so much for the introduction. I should say that Ariel uh, um, is also part of this project, and we've recently uh, been working together, which has been wonderful. Um, and I'm also part of Catherine's amazing um, uh, ERC project as well. So this is just to say that most people who are thinking about algorithms and refugees hang out together and talk to each other and and collaborate and write papers uh, because um, I think the strength is in kind of academic numbers uh, with these things. So I, I guess I want to pick up on a few things that, um, that, that Catherine says and kind of give some broad perspective on what we've done and how it can relate to uh, the current uh, issues that the Ukrainians are facing. So um, one thing to say is we, we don't know a lot about how refugees do. Um, this is very important to recognize. And I think this kind of lies at the core of a lot of um, uh, you know, things that we often conjecture. Um, Catherine's very last point was, will refugee do better off if they have the ability to choose the country in which they resettle or they had some choice? I would love to get an answer to that question. Goodness, it would make an introduction to a paper much, much easier to write. Um, we don't have any evidence for this, and it's in part because um, um, of again what Catherine says, which is that you know most you know refugee allocation systems that we've had, the very few that have been uh, uh, systematic, um, have forced refugees into the system, and they have given them very little choice. So the current situation is somewhat unprecedented in that we have a refugee population that is able to move and express some choice, and I think even um, if you look further afield beyond the uh, EU, but not very far beyond to the UK, even the UK system is actually uh, now offering refugees some semblance of choice. And of course, that's exactly what you've been talking about. Um, systems, kind of platforms, essentially, that allow refugees to be matched to hosts. So what um, is probably worth kind of putting our project in a bit of a perspective, what we've done, um, you know, in, a, in a just a few sentences, and uh, most recently, the last iteration has been with um, Ariel and, and his wonderful student, Paul Girls. Um, is to try to optimize outcomes of refugees, which does not use preferences of refugees, sadly, because those preferences are not available to us. Um, we were trying to, uh, we are trying to optimize the outcomes of refugees resettled to the United States. And for these refugees, we have an outcome variable, which is employment at 90 days. And of course, to everyone on this call, this will seem like a very odd thing to optimize because it's not income, it's not your salary after 90 days, it is whether or not you are in a job. Now, we did not pick this outcome, it should be said, right? And I think this is again part of this kind of broad political context you often find yourself in when doing this kind of work, is that this is actually the outcome that the US government wants the refugee resettlement agencies, which are tasked with the resettlement, to optimize. And because that's the outcome that the government wishes them to optimize, that is the thing that they measure. And so very often we find ourselves, I think, in these contexts kind of um, collecting data on things that we sort of need to collect data on. And I think the US kind of offers us a pretty extreme uh, uh, case in point for that. Um, so uh, there's, I, I, I don't think either Ariel or I um, have, have, have any doubt that this is a very imperfect proxy for refugee welfare. Um, perhaps so imperfect that, you know, maybe it is even useless. Um, but we do hope that nevertheless, you know, um, uh, kind of short-term employment will hopefully have some impact on long-term employment. There's evidence for that. And in general, long-term employment, there is evidence of what happens uh, 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 to people's welfare and their other outcomes, schooling, healthcare, and so on elsewhere. So that's one kind of uh, side of it. Now, of course, here in this context, we simply do not have this kind of data. I mean, the Ukrainian population is quite unusual um, because um, there hasn't been... Um, you know, mass migration of Ukrainians, uh, uh, you know, within Europe recently. And so in a way, part of the problem is that you're starting out by having to figure out how well the refugees would be doing in different kinds of areas that they might be resettled in. And that essentially takes time because you need to resettle them, see how well they do, 
and then use that data to then perhaps optimize the resettlement of people over time. And there are methods of doing this. And, and we've developed, been recently trying to develop some work, trying to think about how you would do this. When you face a new population, imagine, let's take the case of America in the same way. I mean, just to kind of keep things as close to our context as possible. How is America going to be resettling Ukrainians? America resettled a lot of Ukrainians in the past, but not so many recently. Now, this larger population is going to be coming in. We don't actually have relevant data on uh, on uh, how well the refugees will be doing. And so what you do, one of the things you can do in this context is uh, to use what's called statistical learning. And the way you do it is you say, okay, well, look, since we have no data, we're just going to have to try out some places for these Ukrainian refugees and measure their outcomes. And, and over time, we will be able to pick up patterns in how well different kind of Ukrainian refugees will be doing in different kind of areas. Now, that will mean that we'll know roughly where they should be going. And what's kind of interesting about this is that there is an optimal amount of kind of experimenting that you should be doing until you really figure out where people are going to be doing well. So there is a kind of a great, uh, a beautiful science behind this that, that tells you exactly how much you should be experimenting and how much you should be using the knowledge that you have to really place refugees in the best possible areas. So that's one thing that you can actually do in this context already. If that is what you're interested in, is indeed you know maximizing refugee outcomes. Now, of course, in our context, it would actually be quite easy to do because we constantly um, uh, monitor and measure outcomes. You know, we have very good data. It's very difficult to set up infrastructure to track refugees and to measure their outcomes. Obviously, this is a kind of population that is kind of naturally on the move. And even if refugees find a first place of settlement, very often they're having to move um, uh, again and again. And so it's difficult to keep track. And I think one of the great challenges, actually, I think just developing uh, both the science and the policy behind this is actually finding low cost ways of tracking refugee outcomes without, you know, infringing on their privacy and their rights. Because we actually know rather little, I think, um, or you know, just not enough, basically, to be able to make the tools that we have um, in, you know, optimization theory and statistical learning kind of powerful enough, because these tools work really well if you have enough data, and they just don't kind of, you know, hit their their peak if if the data is not there. So that's sort of one side of it. The other, you know, the other kind of way of thinking about it is, you know, actually this is not about centralized matching at all. I guess this is exactly what the discussion has really been about is the natural way of approaching this uh, this uh, um, uh, kind of situation that we have now is a kind of decentralized matching system, as we would say, right? So refugees can go out and they can you know find different hosts, and we already have evidence that this has not worked very well. So if the states have a role to play in this, is to be quite robust about establishing how these systems work setting the rules of the game and providing information to refugees. There were, you know, it, where Catherine's based in Berlin, very soon after refugees were arriving, there was predatory behavior at train stations. Now, this is, of course, you know, offline predatory behavior, but exactly the same thing have been happening um, uh, to refugees uh, in the UK who have been arriving. This is a serious safety issue, of course, right? So while we don't need to centralize the matching system, I think there is a huge role to play, you know, of course, for the state to make sure that the system is working properly. The other part of it is actually related to how you might run a centralized matching system. And the difficulty in doing preference-based centralized allocation is that it is very difficult to elicit preferences. So in particular, I remember when I started working with the Home Office um, uh, just after the uh, Syrian refugee crisis, uh, uh, six years or so ago, one of the things that the Home Office was, I think, justifiably worried about is that refugees just didn't have enough information to express preferences of where in the UK they might wish to settle. And so the, the kind of, if, if you don't mind me sharing the kind of internal joke from the Home Office was that when you ask people where they want to go, they would say, you know, Manchester United, Liverpool Football Club, etc. Right. And so places were connected to, you know, symbols of Britain, football, whatever it might be, cooking, whatever it is, probably not cooking, right, but whatever, you know, the symbols of, you know, uh, Britain, you might think of. And 
this is obviously a concern because then really the preference information you're getting is is nonsensical, right? It's kind of based on things you see on TV or you read on the internet rather than places that could really help uh, you know, refugees thrive. And again, just to really emphasize, there is fantastic evidence uh, from places like Denmark uh, and indeed even from the US that where the refugee is initially allocated dramatically affects not just their outcomes, but the outcomes of their children. And it is not just that bad places make refugees do do poorly, it is that certain places are good for certain kinds of refugees. Now, this is exactly why our employment-based system in the US actually works, is because in turn, it turns out you can optimize. But if you're going to have a system based on preferences, and indeed you might say, okay, well, actually satisfying people's preferences is the objective, rather than an objective being something like employment, it better be the case that the preference you actually get into the system are the ones that are going to tell you something about people's true preferences. They're not just you know, telling you things that either you might wish to hear or things that are actually not going to be connected to how well, how happy they're going to be in say one or two or three years time. And so I think there is actually quite a big role for the state to try to provide information on the locations and places where the hosts are based. Of course, the vast majority of the hosts who are wanting, say, where where I am based in the UK, who are wanting to um, who are wanting to uh, house refugees, are well-meaning people who have provide fantastic accommodation in lovely locations with great schools. But actually, understanding what these places are like is really difficult when you are just talking to a uh, to one particular host. I think it would be much better if refugees were given much better, much finer grained information about the kinds of areas they're in and actually had some options to pick some hosts around. At the moment, the process is so decentralized that you're kind of shooting in the dark trying to find uh, uh, hosts in some areas that you know seemingly look nice because you know you kind of look at them on Google Maps and so on. It would be great, I think, to provide quality and 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 relevant information to refugees who are actually trying to find hosts and i think this is the this is the huge shortcoming of a lot of the uh, systems that are being upcoming on stream i think they're kind of not really they're still lacking this uh, this information that refugees really need so just to sort of wrap up um if i'm going to kind of run, run out of my uh, allotted time slot but hopefully there's enough there to stimulate a bit of discussion you know while i think you know we can you know, we might not be able to just translate the context that we now understand very well in the US to what we have uh, 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 happening in you know, Europe at the moment. Um, we nevertheless can still use, you know, maths and stats and, you know, tools from science to be able to improve outcomes. But we, we're just going to have to adapt to the right context. And even though, you know, the kind of centralized matching I've Catherine mentioned and others, um, you know, might not work in this context. And that's probably, perhaps it's actually a good thing, right? We're not having to force people into this. We're not forcing them to make uh, choices, giving them options about it. I still think there is a huge amount of oversight and added information and, you know, you know, regulation of some kind or another um, that ought to be present um, 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 across these platforms. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ali, can I jump in for a sec on, uh, maybe you can say in one minute, two minutes, briefly something about refugees.ai uh, uh, in terms of uh, the goals of, uh, of such a system or the criteria uh, that are used, or even the state interest in participating in, in this system. It's kind of very important because you also have some practical uh, experience. Thank you for letting me do advertising. It's very kind of you. So, as I said, Refugees AI is um, is a, a collective of independent researchers who are who have you know basically become friends through doing this research. And you know we um, we want to do good uh, by you know applying our knowledge to this problem. The where we've had the biggest success is working with a resettlement agency in the U.S. called HIAS, who has um, you know kindly shared both their expertise and their internal staff and their data with us to be able to help them uh, optimize these outcomes. As I said, what we optimize is 90 day binary employment. Um, have you got a job or not after 90 days? That's our metric. And again, we do it because that's what the State Department requires the resettlement agencies to do. It's a very specific context, but in the process that we've been doing this, because 
the collective has the brilliant minds of people like Ariel and uh, and Paul and Andy Trapp and Nagas Ahani. I'll just mention all of my co-authors. Um, so they, because of you know this kind of collective knowledge that's there, actually we've been developing a lot of independent tools and talking to governments in uh, UK and Sweden and uh, folks in Germany as well to try to see how we can adapt the tools to to uh, uh, to the different contexts. So if you're interested in this stuff. Email us, please join, please introduce us to people in your government. We will happily find the time to come and talk. We've got loads of ideas about how to fix all sorts of refugee matching problems. Um, and so we would gladly help anytime. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, and our last speaker is uh, perhaps uh, the person who can make it kind of a reality uh, in the real world. This is Professor Ariel Procaccia. Uh, professor Procaccia is one of the, the leading scholars worldwide in AI. He is a, computer, a professor of computer science at Harvard University and also a member of the Harvard Center for Research and Computization and Society and the Institute for Quantitative Social Science. Uh, previously, uh, when we first met, uh, he was a faculty member at the Computer Science Department at the Carnegie Mellon University. Um, he has written on the topic, as uh, already been mentioned, on refugees and been involved in uh, digital platform initiatives, including these refugees and AI. And also, I must say that when I started my research on the topic, I think it was in your presentation in Berlin that I learned about, or perhaps a bit, a bit later, about the difference between the kind of the market design approach for matching and this uh, data-driven approach. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Liav. So I should also mention, uh, Liav was actually the one who introduced me to the area by inviting me to this uh, workshop in Berlin. I think it was 2018. So that's when I started kind of reading about the, the area and that led to that presentation, which later led to a paper with uh, my student Paul Welts that uh, Alex mentioned. And that paper led to the, facilitated the beginning of the collaboration with Alex, which has been just an amazing opportunity to make a small contribution to Annie Moore, which was already in place and doing amazing work even before we started collaborating. So, um, I guess I just want to uh, build on some of the points that were made and add my perspective from kind of a broader computer science AI perspective. Uh, so one point that was uh, brought up by Zach, um, and I think is also, also kind of implicit for me in the, in the title, Algorithmic Fairness for Asylum Seekers and Refugees, with, which Catherine mentioned is the title of her project. Um, so the, the, the point Zach brought up was this question of do people with, who are identical in some sense get identical outcomes under the system? So, uh, you know, I think it's interesting that a system like the one Alex described anymore that, um, you know, just to recap, what it does is it predicts employment probabilities based on data and then you know, finds a matching that optimizes expected employment according to the metric that Alex mentioned. That seems like an, un, you know, I mean, in principle, it is an unbiased system that would give essentially identical outcomes to people who are identical up to issues of capacity. Uh, so in that sense, you know, the, this is an advantage of this kind of optimization-based approach that although, you know, we, there's of course very controversial about the, the specific optimization objective and so on, like it, it in principle does have that advantage of being unbiased on the surface. I think, you know, an interesting point to make is that there is a lot of discussion in AI exactly about this point, about whether algorithms that are can be seen as unbiased because they're based on data and are objective, are they really unbiased? So the, the, the interpretation of the term algorithmic fairness in AI is exactly this point. Uh, is our algorithms based on machine learning actually unbiased, actually fair to the stakeholders involved in the algorithm? And you know, it's a very um, it's a very um, complicated question, but you know, I think it's something we, we need to keep in mind that. For example, if the predictions that are being made for different populations, you know, it could be more accurate for a certain subpopulation and uh, less accurate for a different population, that would ultimately introduce bias into the algorithm. So even if the machine learning algorithms are not perfectly accurate, that is a way of introducing bias into this kind of system. So it's, you know, so, the, so on a high level, I think this kind of system does address this concern to some degree, but the topic is much more complicated than that, and we can discuss it further. 
that's point number one. Uh, point number two is uh, a point that Catherine brought up about this issue of being told by a machine what to do. Um, so this is also something that's you know a huge topic of discussion in AI, this issue of explainability and interpretability of uh, outcomes kind of uh, given by an AI system. And th there's a huge body of work in recent years about how to make these decisions accessible or, you know, or recommendations accessible to a person and um, you know, have them both question where these decisions came from and uh, accept the logic behind them. So I can give a couple of examples from my experience to illustrate this a bit, uh, ju just to say that even with uh, algorithms, we can explain decisions sometimes in a way that makes them more acceptable. So one example is, um, an area that I've worked in quite a bit, which is fair division, how to fairly divide stuff. Uh, so we have this, um, this you know, not-for-profit service to help people in small stakes decisions like dividing rent in an apartment, dividing goods like an inheritance, and so on. And there, the, the high-level principle is to um, make these decisions, recommendations, in a way that satisfies provable mathematical fairness guarantees. And then when you give the outcome to people, so we both explain what the guarantee is, and when you get the outcome, we explain why it satisfies the mathematical fairness guarantee that was promised uh, in the beginning of the process. And there are studies, uh, not by us, by Min Kyung Lee, for example, and others, uh, that do kind of measure how this contributes to people accepting uh, these kind of recommendations. So th that's one example in the area of fair division that has an explicit fairness component. Uh, another example of something we've worked on is automating recommendations for uh, food allocations. So this is basically work with a food bank that receives donations and has to, to decide which recipient organizations should receive an incoming food donation. The organizations are food, pant food pantries and soup kitchens and so on. And the, the system is based on machine learning. It's basically modeling the preferences of stakeholders and then aggregating predicted preferences uh, in order to make recommendations. And uh, there, there's also, you know, ultimately a, a dispatcher who has to make these allocation decisions, gets a recommendation from the system and decides whether to accept that recommendation or not. So there, there's also a very big element of, you know, in order for this to be acceptable, you really have to explain where these decisions are coming from. And I won't go into the details of how it's done, but certainly, you know, we and others have done quite a bit of work on uh, really explaining these decisions, and there is quite a bit of evidence that when the decisions are explained, it does make them much more acceptable and kind of maybe adds the, the human element to these uh, algorithmic decisions. So that's point number two. Point number three, which I have a bit less to, less to say about, but I thought I would maybe just mention it, is um, Alex Manson mentioned this issue of uh, kind of online learning in cases where we don't have previous data. So kind of trying out different outcomes, learning from that and improving our, um, our kind of placement decisions. Uh, so th this is something I, I would be really delighted to talk about Alex later. Um, but you know, just to make a quick point, in this literature, there is, there is this kind of um, idea of exploration. It sounds really bad, but the technical term is exploration versus exploitation where exploitation is in the context of exploiting the knowledge that we've already had. So for example, you know, we might already know that in, the, in our context, placing a refugee in a certain location is likely to lead to a good outcome. But maybe if we explore and try out something new, we, we might find an even better alternative that would help future cases. Uh, so there, is, there, you know, there are many algorithms that help you make this trade-off. And in many contexts, you know, this trade-off wouldn't be so controversial. But I think in this context, I, I really worry about the ethics of doing this kind of random exploration that's required for these algorithms. So it's, it's again, like a very thorny topic. And you could argue that it would help future refugees. But I think this kind of dilemma becomes much, much trickier in the context of refugee resettlement. Uh, OK, so I'll maybe stop here, and then maybe we can explore some of these topics in the discussion. Wonderful. Thank you, Ariel. Um, this, uh, now uh, we go to the, the main dish. We want to ask some questions, some difficult ones, about technological design, um, uh, normative uh, puzzles and uh, challenges, uh, also economic uh, aspect of it. Um, 
I'll pick up, so I'll try to uh, from the questions that we already have on the chat. And one of the question uh, is asking whether refugees shouldn't firstly be given the choice uh, for places which are better uh, than the current region in terms of um, um, cultural, um, in their current region and culturally similar first. And this kind of raises, I think, the question of, of criteria that I want to bring uh, into the table. When you design such a system, um, my, if I have kind of, I'm a legal scholar, a legal theorist, if I have to choose the criteria in addition to what we already discussed, I would probably choose things which are also related uh, to not just the labor needs, but also, for instance, this uh, cultural compatibility. But I assume that this is something uh, that is not in the system. Uh, and I wonder why. Uh, perhaps Catherine can say something about uh, the law of some, if you, if, if you kind of insert any type of cultural criteria, uh, but whether there is also a question of whether it's kind of technologically possible and how you measure it. But intuitively, I would, mention, I would imagine that there are certain cities and towns, kind of certain areas in which refugees are more likely uh, to be uh, positively accepted and then it kind of maximized the, um, the possibility of success. So anyway, this was just one example, the cultural, cultural aspect, but this, I think the question that we have in the chat is more about the criteria, how you would design the system, by which even criteria you choose the criteria. Perhaps somebody can say something about that. Yeah, Alex. May I? So um, it's a great question. Um, uh, it's because this gets asked a lot, um, I think. And so this question um, I, I've heard a few times before. Um, so let, let let me say the following. So the the way that I think you're phrasing the question is sort of s supposes that you know something about the preference of, of refugees and what is a good fit. And so behind a lot of questions a bit like this, um, I think is some kind of kind of paternalistic, well-meaning paternalistic impulse, which is that mm -hmm. I think I know where refugees would be doing better. And there are basically two responses to this. One is, um, no, you don't. Um, you should ask refugees for their preferences. This is the pure economist inside me, really, truly believes that people's preferences are very important. The other side of it is, of course, uh, the one I mentioned, which is that you absolutely need to inform people. So I think people will be able to make fairly reasonable choices if you basically supply them information. And if culture is so important to them, they will then go and, you know, select places that are indeed culturally similar. Because I think sort of us deciding on some sort of hierarchy of what's important for refugees is not going to take us to a particularly good place. But if these things are important for the allocation system, the way to think about them, perhaps, and again, this is um, Ariel brought up ethics. We should definitely talk a lot more about ethical issues around this is, you know, how do preferences work on the other side, right? So exactly. I think leave the refugees to decide for themselves, but perhaps there are some mild, and this is where a legal scholar would be very, very useful and great. We have one um, and we have several here, in fact. So um, it, it would be kind of, you know, it's possible to then incorporate these things on the other side, if you like, of this two-sided matching system. So. Um, whether a country could prioritize refugees who speak a particular language um, in some way, perhaps, you know, in a mild way. Um, again, this is not to say that they will get their first choice or anything like that. It's just to express some kind of, you know, preferences over matches in certain areas. You can then incorporate these sorts of things. So they are, as long as you can measure them you and express them. Sorry, you can. As long as you can express them, you know, if you're like mathematically, as long as you can encode them, and you can say, okay, well, you know, this, you know, something like being able to speak a language is the sort of data you often have with refugees. So you might say, you know, in this particular area, refugees who speak English, for example, have a higher priority, right? Now, I, I know how this sounds. I know this doesn't sound particularly good. So I'm just using it as an example. But as long as it's something that you can just encode into a system, you will be able to then do it. Now, then the question is, should you actually use these things? to prioritize different kinds of refugees. And that's where things I think get can get unethical very, very quickly. And so you have to be very clear and transparent. It comes back to Ariel's point. Can you actually explain to people after a match why it is that they've you know, got one place or another? Um, if they've been you know, give, given some options that they don't really, you know, they, they haven't fully 
acquired themselves right through some centralized process and if you have to look people in the eyes and tell them well you know i'm sorry you didn't get this because your priority wasn't high enough because you didn't speak english you might very quickly find yourself in very unethical waters so um while i think a lot of these things are basically possible it doesn't mean that these things should i would be love to actually take it from here and hear catherine on this thing because i and perhaps i have a different opinion but i I think that if you think of a, a system, kind of a two-sided matching system, that then uh, one of the goals, this is why I ask you about the goals, is to maximize the numbers of refugees who are being uh, admitted in member state, then you might want to take into account also some preferences within the legal discourse and normative and ethical considerations that would help for, uh, uh, for increasing the success rate. Yeah, I suppose when I when I read the question, I, I just wanted to comment a little bit about, I mean, the way that this discourse is usually mobilized, which isn't really specific to matching platforms, but usually, I mean, and the Syrian uh, refugee crisis would be the exemplar of this, but it's an exemplar of a much more general phenomenon. There's a we, Global North or Europeans, saying refugees are better off over there, and there are all sorts of rank and inaccurate assumptions about cultural affinity and neighboring countries. So, you know, I don't think that Syrians are at home in Turkey, for example, um, and often don't have a language. And many Syrians who spoke French or English, you know, get stuck, got stuck in Turkey due to this kind of way of saying, well, that's over there. Okay, there are all sorts of other geopolitics and questions about opportunities. So, I mean, I just think we need to just pause and think about that. There's a general assumption about what is the region, what is proximity, that proximity mat matches onto affinity, you know, and these are, you know, often just wildly inaccurate ways of drawing a map of the world that doesn't map onto any of these questions. Uh, I'm not saying the questioner was asking it in that way. I'm just saying the way this discourse is often kind of reflected in the institutional realities. I mean, it, I think if we were seriously designing a system which was trying to both give refugees more choice and more and more information, just emphasizing that point that Alex mentioned, um, and was also concerned about um, local communities or whatever the hosting um, level that we're going to empower is, whether it's a municipality or, you know, a school district. Um, you know, I, I suppose the, the question would be, what are you assuming in the way that you're posing the question about fit? I mean, I can see that linguistic ability matters, um, that that's, but very, but what are the other questions about fit that are going to matter? Um, I would think that capturing on the willingness of a host community can be hugely important, like capturing on the solidarity. So, that, but these are very ephemeral things, right? And, and to me, setting up institutions that can increase knowledge and understanding and thereby increase solidarity is hugely important for integration. You know, creating a sense of shared responsibility for the fate of refugee children in schools, for example, you know, encouraging like everyday interaction so that people feel welcome and have better access to language classes and support, that's hugely important. And I guess the question that I would have then on the technical side is, can that be encoded? Or is it better to step back from these, to just not to focus on the algorithm alone and think about like the surrounding institutional context? You know, I think that these systems, if they are going to capture on a, you know, sometimes there's a very short time window of solidarity. And then you want to capture that somehow institutionally and build on it, build trust, right? So how can you use these kind of mechanisms to build trust on both sides? from refugees and local communities. And I think if we can think about these sort of technical, not just as what we encode, but also how we institutionalize, I think then I find this discussion like more fruitful. I suppose I'm just very, very wary of discussions about fit and cultural affinity because they just, you know, they we cringe for a reason. It just becomes rank essentialist and very quickly racist or Islamophobic or, or xenophobic very quickly. So, so if you can, if we can open up the space about cultural fit without it sliding very quickly, degenerating into that space, then I'm happy to keep that discussion open. Sure. 
but let's see. Uh, yeah. But I think the increasing compatibility was a very important uh, contribution that you mentioned. It all can also apply, by the way, to individuals who are willing to uh, sponsor refugees, not just state organizations, like the kind of the Canadian model, in which people would say, okay, I'm willing to take a refugee, but if he speaks, for instance, in Germany, German or English or some other thing. I really want to comment on that, or shall I move to the next question? I can maybe just add a quick comment. Um, uh, so, you know, another th one thing to keep in mind related to what we were talking about before is that um, the the kind of uh, optimization-based framework, as we discussed, has some potential to be unbiased up to various uh, issues. The With uh, preference-based matching, I think one has to be even more careful about various issues. So, for example, you know, and, and again, uh, Thinking about the point of like you know people people who are similar getting very different outcomes, that for for example might depend on different knowledge. As Alex mentioned, it seems crucial to inform people. Otherwise, you know you just kind of uh, your preferences may be based on very shallow things that you've heard. Uh, another issue to keep in mind is strategic manipulations. This is something that matching theorists have, have thought a lot about. And I also worry that unless you design the system with very you know certain properties in mind you would have situations where people who are more savvy about kind of manipulating the system might really get ahead and get much better outcomes than other people who are in many ways very similar. Thank you, Ariel. Zach, any insight on the topic of criteria? Yes, uh, very, very quick comments uh, on for Alex. Uh, the, the ability to collect data is very easy for refugees, it's very cheap. And the easiest thing in the world is to ask a refugee about their preferences. I did my master thesis on this. I asked people about their preferences. And of course, I asked whether they were allocated or they were, whether they were not allocated to try to compare the two groups. And then, of course, I asked, in case you moved, why did you move? So at least I have the German data. I'm very happy uh, to work uh, with you later. But I think that there is a certain um, aspect uh, that I agree with Catherine that sometimes this data can be misused. I did not ask anything about religion or protests and so on. And I think it's very important to hire some of the refugees from the community because there are certain topics that you cannot ask of the Syrian community that you can ask of others and vice versa. So this is a way that I think when it comes to practicalities, we can... Uh, move from them but it's very very important for example what Alex what uh, Leah was saying if I speak Hebrew you can assume my religion if I speak uh, something else you can assume something else so there's always correlating variables that you need to think about so it's not a clear-cut uh, decision but it's definitely in my personal opinion I think bias and noise are two separate things we can get rid of noise we cannot get rid of bias I might as well get rid of one while I can Thank you, Zach. This is exactly where Catherine says that um, uh, linguistic and cultural based criteria might become uh, racist and they will slippery slope. Um, I uh, want to pick another question, not according to the order necessarily, because it's related. Uh, Kam Kabanda Umar is asking uh, how this, the design of the system can um, and in, perhaps even should pay attention to special need of uh, women and children how you kind of create a system that also take into account special considerations. Anything on the te technological design of something like that, the normative uh, aspect? I, 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 I'll guess I'll just try and say a few, uh, just a couple things that come immediately to mind, um, since we do have to deal with this even in the US because a lot of uh, the refugees are, uh, who've been women and girls at risk, for example, it's an entire UN category, you, you see refugees in that category a lot in the US. Um, I think a lot of it comes down, uh, as Zach was sort of mentioning, to collecting data. It's not, in my experience, been as easy and as cheap. It's okay to do a survey, it's much harder to be completely comprehensive, which is what you need to be uh, when you are matching every person. And here, I think, what is really crucial is understanding the needs of the refugees. So we've been talking a lot about preferences, but we haven't quite paid enough attention to needs of refugees. One of the things that we collect data on, or I should say the State Department collects data on, is um, refugees' medical histories, which they do not share with us, but they do have data on that. And these are crucial uh, in principle to make sure that refugees do well. Now, the same thing happens, for example, if you're thinking about women and girls. So there's the needs of the refugees on the one side, 
But there's also the infrastructure, the public services that are available in a particular local area for those refugees. So both of these data are actually quite difficult to comprehensively capture. Now, remember, you're actually trying to do this the, the latter, you're trying to do this on a scale of a country. You're trying to map out, you know, every, uh, you know, women's center, you know, therapists and so on, you know, doctors that have, spe you know, specific spe specialisms, for example. On the other hand, you're really trying to understand the mental and the physical well-being of a very vulnerable group, which is a very difficult, you know, and time-consuming data to collect. So this is this is very difficult. If this data were collected, I am sure that we would figure out ways of acting on it as well as we possibly can. But while you are doing this, two things then come up. Number one is the thing I've already mentioned. You need to make sure you regulate the platforms because um, if we are thinking about decentralized platforms, you have to worry about, it's got to be safety first. It can't really rely on any other kind of principle. It's, it's, it needs to be safe uh, uh, for people. And the other one is, of course, since you're going to be collecting very sensitive data, is how do you protect that data? And how do you make sure that it is used? Because you know, if we want to use this data, it will be used by researchers like, like the ones on this, uh, um, um, on, you know, on this call. How do we make sure that this data is used properly and it's protected and so on, right? So Can you say something about that because there is a question precisely on that. How do you protect values and preferences? I take it as a question also uh, regarding data protection. We are very strict with ourselves. We sign NDAs and we follow them by the letter. That's how we do it and that's how we will always do it. So, you know, we never compromise the data that is being entrusted to us. Of course, we follow the strictest protocols. We anonymize things to the extent that's possible so that we can actually still do research on this. We obviously don't see any of the identifying information, but even if you don't have identifying information, you have to be very careful with how you use the data because it can still be possible to, to of course, uh, you know, in principle with often with extra additional data actually identify people. You need to be very, very careful with how you do it. Um, there are protocols in place and, you know, um, every country I've worked in has different types of protocols, but, you know, as long as you follow the protocol to the letter and you're, you're careful and honest about this, sometimes you have to go to, as we call them, safe rooms where you can only do analysis inside the room and you can't leave. That's, uh, you know, we've had to deal with issues like this. You couldn't take the data off site. So, our wonderful collaborator, Nagas, had to go physically inside Hyas's offices because the data could not be moved. Um, um, or certain kinds of data couldn't be moved at all off-site. So, you know, you, you, you use all the precautions possible. And I think, you know, technology is now developing where actually it becomes easier to, to do this kind of work. But this is, you know, this is always front and center for anything. Any kind of research that gets done needs to pay attention to this. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I think I have two, two sort of uh, related observations prompted by the women and children question, because, of course, that framing is very also very patriarchal and problematic. Um, but as I think partly it's just worth just stepping back a bit from the resettlement juncture where where Annie Moore comes in, right, where you have a cohort of refugees who have been selected for resettlement to the US because that's the end of a very, very long process. Um, and there are two totally separate decision-making processes. One is, are people refugees? And often when that's a decision made in Lebanon or Egypt or Kenya, that may be a decision made on group, but usually in these sort of systems, the individuals who are in a, what's called a resettlement pipeline will still have an individualized assessment. Um, and that's, you know, does their predicament meet a legal definition of the refugee? And that should be gender sensitized, um, but not prioritizing women as refugees. I mean, the idea of refugeehood is that everybody who meets this particular um, standard is a refugee, right? It's not about allocation of a scarce good. It's about recognition of a particular kind of legal and uh, ethical need that the international system recognizes. But then there are only a tiny number of resettlement places. So the practice that's evolved there is this, again, and I think here it's really arbitrary, uh, is a selection of the most vulnerable. And there, I don't think there's any fair way to do it. In fact, it's, it's, it's selecting amongst populations where nearly everybody is acutely vulnerable if you're saying vulnerability to what if you're talking about vulnerability to protracted poverty vulnerability to violence vulnerability to insecurity i mean if you're talking about 
Syrian refugees in Lebanon, unless people are extremely wealthy and have a lot of independent means, they're going to be in this category of vulnerable to um, certainly extreme poverty. So it's a it's always arbitrary. Okay, and then this is and then Annie Moore comes in after all of that selection has been made. So a long time waiting to decide: Are you really a refugee? A long time double assessed by UNHCR and a state? Are you going to meet these resettlement criteria? Is there anything in your profile that makes you look like you might be excluded from refugee status on security grounds? So it's arbitrary, arbitrary, arbitrary. <laughs> and then trying to make it a bit better at the end. And I'm not minimizing the importance of making it a bit better at the end, but like really, you know, we could get so enthused about these technological fixes that make something better and forget to look at the entire system. And I think then the question about women and children in this becomes, you know, just a much bigger question about, about the situation of refugees in situations where, you know, people's basic rights and needs and preferences are not met. <laughs> so so I, I don't want to lose sight of that. Um, and, but I think this question about, um, you know, obviously children, depending on their age, have different needs, but they, there are also different ways of hearing their voices. So, I mean, the entire ethos of the Convention on the Rights of the Child is about both. It's about um, enabling children's decision making as well. And we rarely do that at all in any aspect of the refugee regime. So there are very rarely procedural protections for children to, to express themselves on any of these questions. So it may not be just about children's rights, their children's needs. There could also be questions about children's rights. Um, and I think the other phenomenon that's rife in the refugee regime is treating uh, women as ancillary applicants along with men. Um, and then one of the interesting phenomena, gaming phenomena that refugees who always try to use their agencies sometimes do, is women get divorced in order to have a shot at resettlement. So, so this is not very well documented, but you know, if you do have women and children extra vulnerability programs, you know, this might be, there may be well situations where family separation is something, you know, in extreme cases where refugees are aware that this might give them a shot at resettlement. But this is at a, in a context where less than one tenth of one percent of refugees get resettled. So this is why you can never have a fair resettlement process, because it's selecting from amongst all the, all the equally vulnerable. Um, so I really wanted to add that in because I find it very difficult to talk about, you know, women and children or even just broader gender questions in these processes without just broadening the discussion a little bit about, about the context for these, these various bits of a, a system which in all sorts of ways has very deeply gendered impacts um, across, across it. Thank you for that. I see that we have a more incoming question and I want to cover at least some of them before we have 10 minutes before uh, we end the session. Uh, so I'll pick up now on Francesca's uh, question. She's asking, what are the options to improve the algorithm with data about recipient, recipient organizations? And of course, it, it can also be not just about organization, but also about other hosts. And perhaps I can zoom out from this question to even a broader question about how should success and failure be measured? Uh, if you do measurement and success as failure, how do you define it? And then what can be learned from um, how can you improve data on success and failure if to go back to Francesca's question on uh, by looking the, on data over time? Anything on that or? It's okay. out but if you want, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll just say some provoking things which are probably wrong, and then the Ariel and Catherine can correct me. I, uh, so my, my view is just please measure. Um, it's really not, I, I cannot emphasize enough. Every context I've worked in, um, it's uh, it, actually getting good data on refugees has been hard. And I appreciate surveys are easy to do, but actually you really do need to have a co comprehensive view of these things. Um, and it has to be over time and that actually becomes quite expensive. Tracking, you know, collecting panel data rather than a cross-sectional survey. There's often a, you know, a huge difference in this. Um, so I, I would say measure, I was, you know, without, pointing any fingers. Um, if you look at the Syrian success, the 20,000 Syrians who were resettled under, under the Syrian Vulnerable Person Resettlement Scheme in the UK, um, what do we know about their outcomes? 
Um, not much, it turns out. And, you know, frankly, this is unacceptable. We, we can't do this again, and we can't keep doing this. Whenever we have a crisis, we don't have systems in place to be able to measure outcomes of people, because then there is no accountability, actually. Um, and there is not just accountability of a government, it's also accountability of people like me and Ariel who come and help, because we should be held accountable for the systems that we build, um, and people should be able to come and verify we've actually done a better job for refugees. So um, collect data, um, keep it safe, um, share it in a safe way with researchers um, is what I would say. And organizations, I think, you know, different kinds of organizations need to be open to it. One of the great things about working in the US was that we could work with an NGO rather than with the government. That was a huge blessing. Um, it made things just a little bit easier. It's very difficult to get through the government machine very often. There's a lot of political constraints. Um, it's kind of wonderful to work with an NGO because while they're inside the system, they themselves are quite flexible and open and 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 willing to uh, to improve. So I think a bit of decentralization, perhaps, of resettlement. I mean, from the government directly to the civil society. I think that could be hugely beneficial. And these organisations being open to, to 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 working and having the resources to collect the data that would be fab. Terrific. Ariel, maybe you can uh, add something on that. And I just connected to Francesca's second question, which is about the connection between data-driven decision-making in algorithm and reputation system. Yeah. Um, so for the first question, uh, I think Francesca may have had in mind specifically the food allocation problem because she was talking about recipient organizations, potentially in that context. Um, so let me try to address that and then kind of take it to the refugee resettlement context. Um, for food allocation, the, this application that I mentioned, one issue there about, you know, like you, you would want to base the allocation decisions also based on things like, um, you know, if the donation is, is tomatoes, does the organization currently need tomatoes? But this, uh, this data is very hard to get in real time from organizations. Uh, so, you know, do they have enough tomatoes right now is something that's very difficult to get. I think it gets to the broader point of, you know, this issues of, uh, which data we have access to in making these algorithmic decisions. Right? So in that context, uh, that kind of data is not available. One place where organizations play a role in the decision itself in the food allocation context, which I think we can also use the same idea, although it's, it would be very controversial for refugee settlement, is that, as I mentioned, um, there is basically machine learning applied to building models of the preferences of stakeholders for these type of decisions. And those stakeholders include the recipient organizations. So one of the stakeholder groups explicitly is the recipient organizations. And basically these models of preferences play an explicit role in every allocation decision. They're aggregated together with other models of preferences of other stakeholders to make allocation decisions. So this is a very different paradigm from the, from the paradigms that we talked about so far, but potentially you could also apply a similar approach in the refugee settlement context where you uh, collect preferences from different stakeholders, build models of those preferences, and use those models explicitly in allocation decisions. Um, again, there, there is, you know, there is a, a whole minefield of ethical issues uh, in this kind of approach applied to refugee settlement, but it's kind of something to keep in mind, a, way, a technical way of actually explicitly taking into account uh, preferences of you know, um, cities or countries in this kind of process. Um, a broader point is I completely agree with Alex on you know, just the more data you have, the better if you have a machine learning component, for example, the better these predictions will be. Uh, and then, of course, on the other side, there's the issue of data protection, biases are introduced and so on, but, but collecting more data would always improve machine learning based decisions on a high level, on a technical level. Regarding Francesca's other question of um, reputation systems, um, so let's see if I, you know, so one way to interpret this would be to say in the refugee settlement context, we build a, a, a reputation system for, um, you know, what we call affiliates in the context of uh, HIAS, you know, the, the cities where uh, refugees are resettled. And the reputation is taken into account as one of the factors in allocation decisions. Um, you know, I think the question would be how something like that complements uh, the predictions given by the data, right? So this would also be a data-driven way of evaluating a potential um, 
you know, placement for refugee. And, uh, you know, I think in principle that could be uh, play a role in a an algorithm that takes both that into account together with machine learning based predictions uh, and could potentially help. But you know, I think the to give a more precise answer, one would have to test this approach, which is a very interesting idea. Thank you, Ariel. I want to go to the last question that I can take because we don't have time to discuss all the questions, but it's a kind of a good one because it summarized uh, the topic and bring it more to practicality. And I would uh, allow everyone to say a few words on it. And the question is, uh, what can and should the EU do concretely uh, with matching for to promote matching algorithm the way you describe it and perhaps other ways as well uh, for matching with Ukrainian refugees? So obviously, Global uh, Peace Tech uh, is happy to uh, help you on that. But uh, concretely, what, what do you have in mind that the EU should, uh, should do to promote your ideas? If I can uh, say a couple of things about this, I think the, the discussion shows how complicated this is from legal, economic and political reasons. There is no simple answer. And if there was, I'm pretty sure it doesn't work. So I think the first thing that the EU needs to do is to collect data. We have data on everything that we may or may not need. We don't have data on things that can save lives. I think a bit of uh, support from the EU can be very helpful. So, for example, doing a study similar to the one that I did for the Syrian refugees in Germany, for the Ukrainian refugees in Europe. So ask about their preferences because we're, work we're all theorizing in the dark at the moment. We don't know where would that go. And trust me, refugees tend to stay around their home country because if you've ever met one they tell you we wish to go back so th the first thing is we need to have data in order to figure out what to do with it the second thing is we need to have some of the difficult conversations about what does it mean to have an asylum policy and how are these decisions made because Catherine mentioned before it's very very important uh, some of my friends who applied for a resettlement with the UNHCR in 2014, still have not received their interview. I'm saying this on record. Everybody knows this, but we are all aware that the global refugee resettlement system is broken. And this is why we do this research. So I think it's it's there are some difficult things we need to uh, answer. And then the third step, in my opinion, what should be done for the Ukrainian refugee uh, process is to for the EU to have a multi-level asylum policy for the state, for the private, and for its citizens. So, for example, where we have in Italy, we have uh, a matching uh, platform for Italian citizens to host Ukrainians. We have it in some countries. The UK, they have their own version. Ireland has its version. Canada is the famous one. We need to have a European one. I'm sorry, we share a lot of things. We share a currency. We share a market. We need to have we need to Europeanize uh, this policy. So I would say this will be the current steps forward and hopefully this will be where we would go from here. Thank you, Zach. I'll just uh, mention briefly that uh, you are preparing on behalf of a group of students uh, at the STG uh, policy brief that you're gonna present at the European Commission in my, May to a 12, if I'm not mistaken. So obviously you can do something to promote it. Uh, Global Peace Tech will try to do uh, with you uh, also uh, with the participant here, uh, perhaps a follow-up event with some uh, govern government. Uh, we, we were supposed to have uh, a person, Umberto Rossini from the Italian government. He couldn't, 10 minutes before the, the presentation, he couldn't make it, but we should definitely think of a kind of a follow-up event with some more practitioners. Other people about uh, what can should be uh, done to promote it from uh, in, in the real world? Specifically in the Ukrainian in the Ukrainian war. I I can oh sorry go on Catherine you no, go first go ahead you go first Alex I'll go after you. Um, I, I I would say the thing that would make things happen very quickly is set an objective, um, make sure you're accountable for that objective, and provide some funding. If these three things are in place, then it actually makes sense to then start thinking how do we best use the funding to hit the objective. The issue that I am facing that frustrates me so much is that there is no objective in resettlement. There's no objective in how refugees' lives are going to pan out. We just do things ad hoc every time. We just try to make do and we do it on a shoestring. And it happens over and over again. 
And if there's no accountability and there's no objective, there is no point in trying to optimize anything because there is nothing to optimize because there is no incentive to collect data and there's no incentive to uh, use public resources well and there's no incentive to hold anybody accountable. So I would say, EU, write some rules down. Thank you. Katrin? Yeah. I suppose in the Ukrainian case, I'm just really... Um, I think we have to bear in mind what we're seeing is so atypical. So that we've basically set the, the typical features of the common European asylum system aside. So because, you know, we have access and mobility rights and a work right, at least temporarily, that is going to be accessible quickly. So to me, those the three worst features of the common European asylum system are not currently being imposed on Ukrainians. They can get into the EU without a visa. They can travel and find a place of refuge. Once they register, they have work rights, they have social rights, and their children have educational rights. There's no limbo of waiting for asylum, nor is the even worse and more protracted limbo of waiting to be resettled being currently visited on them. So there's part of me that just thinks, look, some of this happened by accident, like the 2017 decision to give Ukrainians visa-free access to the EU territory did not have in mind a second mass invasion by Russia of Ukraine, right? So, but look, this is what we have happening. And so I'm just very worried that any, any attempt to do formal state-led matching is going to be more coercive than what we're seeing happening right now. And I think as long as people are still able to find accommodation, and there's a lot of social support for them, and there is a lot of public support at the moment, then, you know, things may actually work out. Now, I, I'm surprised I'm saying that, Alex, because, you know, you're saying the state has to regulate, there's predatory behavior on all of these platforms. And I'm not a ne neoliberal. I mean, I'm a liberal. I'm definitely not a neoliberal. I believe in institutions and regulation, but I'm just, you know, right now this is actually happening and sort of working compared to previous refugee sites, uh, crises within living memory. So I'm really conscious that that's something you want to capitalize on. So um, so, so that's a good part of what's happening. And I, I just think building institutions that foster greater trust is going to be hugely important. I think two of the contemporary sort of trends are ones that I would want us to think very carefully about. I think one is any normalization of the idea that refugees have, have to be sponsored in particular community sponsorship. Community sponsorship looks nice and cuddly in Canada, but the idea of it, I think, is actually quite repugnant if you're, gonna, if you're going to say that's the main access route for asylum. You know, asylum means you go and you ask a state for protection or you ask the EU for protection. The idea that you need a prior invitation is not a way to run an asylum system. It's not, it's not going to meet the, the numbers, the need for protection that emerges in unpredictable ways. So I think community sponsorship can be great as a complement or as part of a system, but to, to treat it as the, the, the norm, I think, is really dangerous. And that's a little bit what's happening in the UK at the moment. Uh, and so is the idea long term that refugees are supposed to live in your spare room or your holiday home. I mean, I think, you know, there's a housing issue here, which if we were talking to housing experts and experts on social housing and, you know, mixed communities that have spaces for refugees as well as for you know people with mixed incomes and backgrounds i think that discussion is really crucial but that's a different sort of discussion with different experts needed um, so i would really just want to push back against this normalization of the almost kind of adopt a refugee style of community sponsorship too which i think isn't the way of dealing with um, mass protection needs um, and some of the things that seem to be working at the moment, I don't want to, to, to inadvertently lose them in our enthusiasm for doing optimizing with data. Right. Thank you. I'm convinced, by the way, I, I was very much for the idea. Now, when you talk, I think there are lots of food for thought of reconsidering the community host. Aria, last word. I'll defer to the experts on this. Okay, then. So uh, we are, uh, unfortunately, uh, are at the end of our session. I want to thank uh, Katrin, uh, Ariel, uh, Alex, and Zach for uh, joining us. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining as well. Thank you for our project manager, Miguel Giovenardi, and uh, project assistant, also Lucia Boswer, who really put that together. I wish you an excellent event, uh, evening, and uh, until, until the next event. Ciao, ciao.